Welcome to this event, which is part of the ninth annual Four Corners Festival. The aim of the festival has always been to connect people from across the city of Belfast and beyond, to encourage us out of our own corners to encounter new perspectives, new ideas and new friends. While we can't do this in person this year, we want to offer you a programme that we hope will inspire you to take you virtually to new areas of this wonderful city and allow us all to connect and exchange ideas on a whole range of topics. Our theme this year is breathe. In Hebrew, the word ruach means breath or spirit, the essence of life. Our 2021 festival seeks to tap into that spirit and breathe hope into our city, fostering creativity and resilience as we respond to the challenges of the pandemic and the realities of everyday life, to offer a breathing space. Yet in the context of COVID-19, we have all become very conscious that what we breathe out and breathe in can be as much a potential threat as a source and sign of life. The virus itself affects our breathing and some of the measures taken to slow down transmission have had a disproportionately negative effect on those who are already vulnerable. But COVID-19 is not the only global story of this past year. The dying words of George Floyd in the US I can't breathe, echoed around the world, breathing new life into the Black Lives Matter campaign, prompting protests and raising questions that stretch beyond the borders of the US about the historic impact of slavery, systemic racism and multiculturalism. We want the Four Corners Festival to be a breathing space for people and ideas a place where painful experiences can be aired in a safe environment. All the events in our Four Corners programme are free to attend. We'd love you to support us by attending events and sharing them with your friends. You can also support us financially now or throughout the year by visiting fourcornersfestival.com slash donate to make a donation. We'd like to thank all of those who have supported us in the past, including our existing friends of the festival and all the funders who have enabled the 2021 festival to take place. Your support is invaluable. We hope you enjoy this event and engage with the challenges it will bring to us. Although we can't give you a feedback form in your hand this year, we still need to gather your feedback. So please take a minute to visit fourcornersfestival.com slash survey and fill out the simple form. It makes such a difference uh, with our funders. Thank you. Hi, Michael Wardlow here. I hope you've been enjoying yourselves uh, with the very, very programme of the Four Corners Festival. And I'm really glad you could join us tonight. As you know, the theme for the festival is Ruach, or breath, or breathing. And tonight we're going to be looking at that specifically in the context of race. We're calling the event the Building Breathing Room for Diversity. And we're splitting this into two parts. I'm going to be talking to two colleagues the first part. We're going to have a break for a bit of poetry then going to have a panel of three and we're going to close by some music. So I do hope that you'll stay with us for the whole event and that you'll enjoy yourselves. So I want to welcome the first panel and we have here Eileen Shampoo and Laurie Patsy Barnett. And I'm just going to ask them briefly to introduce themselves and say a wee bit about themselves and then we're going to have a polite conversation and we'll see where it goes. So maybe I'll just ask you Laurie first. Well good evening to everyone. I'm Laurie Gatsy Barnett. I'm a businesswoman entrepreneur and I'm also quite interested as far as um, just community-based work every so often and I'm also founder of Join Her Network which is an all-female global network. Thank you for having me. Thanks Laurie. Eileen and what about you? Hi I'm Eileen Chan-Hu and I'm a member of the um, um, 
Well, I run Crack and I, which stands for Cultivate, Respect, Appreciate Inclusion um, across cultures in Northern Ireland, which is a social enterprise in training uh, in education and inclusion and diversity. I'm also a member of the Minority Migrant uh, Ethnic Council and uh, I'm a trustee of the EU Europeans. Um, I've been in the community and voluntary sector for a long time and now in the social enterprise world. Well, I'm delighted to have both of you with us tonight. And maybe just as you were talking there, Eileen, I'll, I'll continue with you. Tell us a wee bit about how this place became your home. Northern Ireland became my home. Uh, yes, very much so. Um, in the 60s, my father came here uh, with the immigration policy. Um, Hong, um, they're from Hong Kong. And they were able to come with, uh, because Hong Kong was under British rule until 1997. So they were one of the first that came to Northern Ireland and I'm the second generation Chinese. So um, my dad would have come here early sixties. He originally went to London and uh, a group of people said that Northern Ireland was a beautiful place. This is pre trouble time. And he came here and he enjoyed this place. Uh, he worked in Belfast, Derry and then we ended up in Carrick Fergus the long-standing uh, family business there. So um, my brother came nine years later and then a year after that I popped along. So my brother was born in Hong Kong and I was brought up born here. So I'm one of the very first um, Chinese sort of kids that was at that time that were born in Northern Ireland. So made in Belfast. I'm sure people ask you, where do you come from? When you say Belfast, they'll say before that. I'm sure you get quite a bit of that. Yeah, it's constant. It's constant. And as opposed to the accent, you know, um, it's it's confusing to a lot of people. Uh, I still get this thing that it's a novelty to have a Belfast accent in Northern Ireland, although I was born here. Um, and it wasn't very, I was born not too far of all places. Uh, you know, people don't believe me, but off the Shankle Road. So we originally lived off Whitfield Road in Belfast, North Belfast at the time. Um, my name, Eileen, actually comes from Irene's Bakery off the Shankle Road, which was a corner at the corner of uh, Shankle Road. This bakery is called Irene's. So my mum liked the name Irene and chose my Chinese name close to it, which is Eileen or Eileen. And uh, incidentally, the word oi, love, um, means um, love is actually in the word Northern Ireland, but oi ye lam, as in oi or else in Ireland, oi ye lam, oi again. So I think I was destined to be here. <laughs> you couldn't get out of it. Which my middle name. So I'm, I'm meant to be here and, you know, couldn't get more cross-cultural than a name that on the Shankle Road was meant to be Irene, but became Eileen, which is Eileen. <laughs> that's a, I've known you for a long time and that's the first time I heard that. Yeah. So thanks very much. Laurie, maybe do you want to tell us a little bit about your story? Well, I think the expression is I blew in to Northern Ireland about 16 years ago and I'm still here. So <laughs> I think I've, in, I've enjoyed living in Northern Ireland. It's been a different experience considering I've lived in different places before I got here. I was originally born in Harare, Zimbabwe, then traveled across and lived in Pennsylvania in the US, then moved across and worked in Europe quite a bit, ended up in London and then finally here. So it's uh, quite an interesting, I suppose, 360 around the world I've had and now I call Northern Ireland home. So it's been interesting to say the least. Well, that's interesting you say that because often people will say, you know, where it's home for you. And uh, without prompt, you've actually said, this is your home. Uh, that, that's a fascinating. Well, tell me, what is it you do around your home and your day job? Well, I think considering we're all working from home, um, it's a lot of business consulting. And it's also a lot of just looking into the systems of things, whether it's developing a business, managing a business, consulting how to develop things differently. And also taking into, I suppose, using my life experience in the different, I think, communities and cultures I've had to be a part of, and just bringing that to the, to the way I do business, because it takes more than one person, more than one voice, more than one opinion, and more than just one way of doing things. And I think America is the heart of diversity, if I could call it that. So when you have so many people, and when one of my jobs was HR, having to deal with a lot of people from so many different backgrounds, I think for the first time in my life, I realized that maybe I'm not the only one. There's quite a lot of people around and um, you have to tune in and actually listen to people to get the best out of everyone. So, yeah, I quite agree. And you talked also about being involved in a global network. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, I think join her is, is one of those things when you're a little girl, you write things down in your in your diary 
and you you just imagine that you know one day if ever you never really actually think that one day that will materialize into something real i think i must have been 12 and i wrote about Lori's place originally is what it was called and it was just supposed to be a hangout because when you're you know a teenager you want a place to hang out after school where your parents are not going to be annoyed or agitated that you're missing from home so originally as a 12 year old that was the aspiration but obviously the 12 year old grew up and life happened. So that had to evolve into something more tangible, hence join her. And I give credit to my brother for the conversation in his living room where we were talking about, hey, I need a name that's snazzy, that's catchy, that seems to embrace all of the things that I've seen in my life and learned from others as well. And what encapsulate diversity and because I'm a her, why not join her? Because his friend is a join her. So join her just became something that worked Mm. and here it is and it's join her (laughs) well congratulations Eileen you mentioned that you're working with Crack NI um tell us a little bit about what Crack NI does and and some of the other things that you do during your sort of a nine to five if you like Crack NI yeah um it was post 2014 um there were over 921 racial incidents around that time um quite a very bad year if it's not as it is today, but um, at that time, it seemed that cultural relations were really important, you know, meeting somebody, connecting to people of other cultures and to build that. And instead of being you know, reactive, like most of us are at times when something happens or a racial incident happens, I felt about, you know, strongly about training and education. Um, my first sort of main job um, in the community sector was as a English as a second language um, teacher and an education liaison officer. So from those days, I always realized that training was really important, education was important, and that really built understanding. So I could never really understand why people wanted workshops after something had happened. You know, why should we not be proactive? So a group of us came together. Uh, there was Magic Batter, Mohammed, um, Mark Donahue, myself, even Alfred Abelaren in the first meeting. And they were trainers by background. I had my training background and we thought, why can diverse people not promote diversity and promote the education of diversity? So that's why we came together. So that's how I cultivate respect, appreciate inclusion across communities that originally it was called. But the last couple of years, we really have worked towards more towards across cultures and culture being mm. what is culture? You no, know, do you understand what is culture? And it could be lots of ways around that. So um I can say it's, it's a great journey. We have over 15 different nationalities working with us, a lot of them locally here, but we also have gone global. So we have a um, member in um, India, a member in Denmark, we have a European project in um, uh, Italy, Turkey, Greece, and Scotland that we're running at the minute. Um, we have developed a cultural awareness training for trainers course. But really, it's, I don't know, it's my passion. I just love diversity and always mm-hmm. like colors. Somebody says to me about peace. I just think of colors because I feel that something we are all colorful and I feel like everything's diverse. You think about plants, flowers, dogs, whatever, you know, so people are diverse and it's great to be together. And we have good crack, you know, and the Northern Irish word, Irish word Mm -hmm. crack. And it really is about a good crack positive experience. So Eileen, you talked about diversity there and uh, you've, you've lived here. Mm-hmm. And uh, Laurie said she was a blow-in in Northern Ireland parlance uh, 16 years ago. If someone was to say to you, you know, why should they come to Northern Ireland or what do you think are the good things about Northern Ireland, what would your reflection be? Uh, that's, well, reflection is, it's, I might sound biased <laughs> and I teach unconscious bias. Uh, and a biased opinion is, I'm going to say, for me, Northern Ireland is my home. Um, Laura said something, but it really is born in me as my home. And the realization came in 2014. My father was very, very sick. I thought he wasn't going to make it. And I had to spend a month in Hong Kong. And at that time, I had a choice. The first time in my life, I think I was, oh my goodness, 2014 was that six years ago? So I was 44, not young really, but that was the time that I thought, well, do I leave Northern Ireland and stay and look after my father? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And it got better, but I remember sitting on the tube and I was so lonely coming home after the hospital. I didn't know anyone. All my friends are here. All my colleagues are here. My networks are here. 
and I really missed coming back to Belfast and Northern Ireland. And I remember any use of it, Northern Ireland, I'd be frantically reading it every day <laughs> while I was in Hong Kong. So I was living two lives um, in the time zones, and it was very weird. So what I can say about Northern Ireland, to me, I love the countryside here. I think we're beautiful. I mean, they laugh about the Emerald Isle and the rain, but I always say, you can't make it um, green without the rain, <laughs> you know? So I think there's something nice about that. And with COVID now, you, I do miss, I love going down to Errigal Mountain, Donegal, um, our coast. I was brought up in Carrick Fergus. I miss the castle, I miss the beaches. I think we've got beautiful scenery and we have beautiful people. It is a minority what happens to, you know, the discrimination, but generally, you know, I think it could be a really good potential place to be somebody else's home. But this is my home because I, I feel I'm very much born and brought up here. I think we should just take that and give it to Northern Ireland Tourism and market it. <laughs> Laurie, this, the same question to you. If someone was to say to you, well, why, why is this your home? What is it that you would use to, to go back to them and say, this is why this is a good place to be? Well, I would probably say to them that it, home is what you make it. You know, and I think... When you're young, you associate home with it being a place because it gives you comfort and, you know, whether it's your mom's baking or it's your grandparents' love or whatever definition you give home to be, I believe home is what you make it and home is the person. I think it's no longer a place, it's actually the person and the people associated with that person that gives you that home. And I think in Northern Ireland, compared to a lot of places I've been, I know who my you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, who the butcher is and the butcher knows who my daughter is and the grocer is and, 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 and the bakery and everything else. It's very, very communal. You know, I remember going into, I think the first time on Bloomfield, I think Bloomfield Roundabout and I went into the bakers that was there and the butchers just happened to be next door. And over the years, as my daughter's grown up, whenever we walk past, they still remember. They know her name and they can actually remind her and embarrass her quite often, you know, when I'm with her of who she is. So that's what you want to have when it's home because people know who you are. They might not remember your name, but they remember who you are. And the influence of who you are when you're around them, I think Northern Ireland resonates that a lot. If you can come in and I think be open-minded because we're at that place now where it's a situation where we both have to give and take. You know, there's, there's a lot that has happened in the history here but equally, there's a lot of healing and restoration that other people from other places of the world bring here. And their methods of how they cope and how they deal with things difficult and easy. I think if we can, as a community, come together, that's how we get to live together. That's how we get to create a different version of home. So for me, home is a lot of places, but mostly it's what's within me. That's all. So, so both of you have spoken very passionately about this is your home. And the reasons that this has the draw on you for Eileen bringing her back from Hong Kong and for you, Laurie, to keep here, although you've been in other places. But obviously there is the flip side, there's the dark side of that. So maybe if you could tell me, where do you see the most obvious fault lines where people are uncomfortable with difference? I mean, it could be about race, but it, not necessarily. But or where have you seen those? And I'm quite happy if you want to share a personal experience or just an observation. Um, well, I think if I had to look at that, to be fair, I think whenever you come into a community that's so used to each other, and I think in Northern Ireland, you are so used to each other. When you introduce other people into the environment, and I, and I use other, you know, cautiously, because mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting they're insignificant, but it's just simply as a point of reference to say somebody who's different. I think the acceptance of anyone else who is different who doesn't talk like you, who doesn't look like you, who might not like what you like, who might not eat what you eat, who might look at what you see and interpret it very differently. I think there needs to be a lot more flexibility in embracing that. And I can appreciate it's difficult. Everybody carries some degree of baggage, good and bad. And I think when anyone moves to a new place, it's daunting enough to be accepted, to fit in, to be part of any society. And I think in Northern Ireland, sometimes there is a lot of conscious and unconscious bias that happens with people, not because it's correct, but I think sometimes be open to give somebody an opportunity. Let them make a mistake. Don't assume they're gonna make the mistake before they've done it. Cause I think sometimes that is the unfairness that you look at. And I think as a society, give people the benefit of the doubt. I think we, we have that expression. Why don't we apply it more often? We're so quick to, to pass judgment on people you know, whether they're 
immigration status is not what you think. You know, does it make you better if you're a refugee asylum seeker? Does that make you less of a person in any way? I don't think so. I think let's look at people as people and where we can consciously and unconsciously take the time and effort to make those, I think, lines that we create as divisions, maybe because of fear, maybe because to side with the opposite who is different makes you unpopular, do those things because that's how societies change. At least I think that's what we have to all actively do. Okay, so you're really saying in a sense that uh, there are issues. Um, we, we do fear difference here when the other, whoever that is, comes in, there's a threat perceived. But I heard you say, you didn't use the word, but it was a bit like cut them a bit of slack allow a bit of tolerance and don't stereotype. And those are very compassionate uh, reflections that you're making there. But it can't always be easy when sometimes you're the other. So how do you deal with the situations when, when there's obviously tension around or you're perceived that someone's struggling with the difference? Well, I think it's, it's, it's saying the things that are difficult. I mean, we're having this conversation now and there's no right or wrong answers. And I think a lot of times we're so keen to be politically correct that we overlook how we should behave naturally, which could be more useful. So as you so rightfully saying, you don't want to be inflammatory. You don't want to upset mm. a situation. You don't want to trigger somebody. So we're constantly having to think in those terms. But when you can have the candid conversation, like what we're trying to do now, let's call things as they are. And I think when we can do that, some of that is, is even from the local community stating those things because it gives somebody who is a blow in, who is an outsider, it almost gives us permission to be allowed to give our piece to the narrative, you know, because when we're looking at things around here, you know, it's, it's not every day that, you know, you have condescending, sometimes patronizing statements that are said about people. You know, I think one of the things, for example, if you had to say, oh, your English is really good. Did you learn it here? You know, and, and sometimes I know you mean well, but it kind of is like, well, what, how would you expect me to sound? Where else would I have learned it? You know, for example, for me, C.S. Lewis was born here, but I read about C.S. Lewis and I was in Zimbabwe and that's in Africa. I didn't meet C.S. Lewis here. I read about him from somewhere else. So there are all these things that inadvertently connect the world. But I think people have a responsibility. Yes, like you so rightfully said, cut us some slack. You know, and if we do make mistakes, whether it's you or me, let's not be too politically correct. Let's try and find inroads to have these awkward conversations. Like if you have to say, Lori, do you prefer to be called black? Do you prefer to be mm. called colored? What would you prefer? Mm. And allow me the permission to say, you know what? Lori's just fine. My color is not really important. Lori's my name after all. So let's use that. So I think doing that, it's a start. And then the rest, we will deal with it. At least we start somewhere. All right, thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Eileen, I guess the same question to you. Uh, this has been your home forever. Um, you've, you've grown up here, you've been at school here. Um, and I guess there have been situations that you've observed, even though you've been born here. We talked about, you know, where did you come from earlier? So what do you think are the, are the big issues here that you've experienced or would observe in terms of the, 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 the inability to deal with difference, maybe specifically in terms of race? I think it's uh, two things, uh, maybe relationship, um, you know, to get on with people, you have to have a good relationship and it's not easy um, to build that. And relationships are built on trust. And when you fear, you can't trust. So that that's, you know, a, a deciding factor in itself. The second one is to be self-aware um, and not everybody is able to do that or can. It's, it's a difficult one. Um, if we think about our similarities, we all have very different dimensions of diversity. I would do this in training, but I mean, I'm just saying, you know, we, we are driven by an income or we're driven by education or we're driven by our personalities. We're driven by whether we have ability or disability or gender, female, male, or either or whatever, uh, sexual orientation. We're driven by our background upbringing. And when we start to see people like that, in those elements, and I'll give you an example. When we always talk about Syrians, why is it always is the image of refugee and asylum seekers? We don't see that person as a woman who may be able to cook well, maybe was educated until the conflict broke out. You know, we have to see people as human beings because we ourselves are human beings here. And so, you know, 
when you strip it down to the similarities, there's more that we have. You know, the famous quote, and there's more that we have in common than divides us. So once you're self-aware, it really does help, you know, and it's not, it isn't, um, it's something that people need to improve themselves and think about, you know, and really use their I suppose, empathy and human compassion, you know, um, to build. And that's when connections can happen. Uh, I'll give you an example. We have a Syrian um, trainer in our group and I call her a trainer. I don't call her a Syrian refugee or asylum seeker. And Garen has come with us at the beginning with not very good English, but she was an amazing cook and she wanted to show her skills of Syrian cultural cuisine with me. She makes this fantastic dish and it's a rice dish. And she talks about the reason for this rice dish was the dish that her parents had made for her for a wedding. And she is apart from them now, but she's able to share that feeling and compassion. And we worked with a group in um, Banbridge, an over 50s group. And before, yes, there may have been myths and stereotypes about Syrian refugees and asylum seekers, but every time we go to that area now, they want us to bring Garen with us. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's when we can make that connection that people are really human. And if we can be a bit more kinder, it will improve. Well, it's fascinating that both of you have answered what was a negative question in a positive way, because I was asking you to name the fault lines and what you've done is come back and tell me how you deal with the fault lines, which is, in a sense, exactly what I would expect for well, your commitment, both your commitments and compassion are to make things better. So, Eileen, maybe leaving aside crack for a minute, have you have you witnessed an example of good practice where where people have been working to try to make people aware that difference is actually something to celebrate? Yes, and it took me years to realize where it came from. Um, it was in primary school. So um, I was called names at primary school. I was the only Chinese kid there. And um, it was brought to attention and it was a day to corporal punishment. So I am that old. And the boys that were involved got caned. Um, they were brought up in front of the assembly, told off, caned. And we were taught in front of the whole assembly, sticks and stones were breaking my bones, but names will never hurt us. Um, in one way, yes, it did make me stronger because I had to learn names will not hurt us. And what do I look at it? Apart from the corporal punishment, which was terrible for the boys and I felt awful for it. Um, I felt it was dealt fairly. It was talked about in the whole assembly and it was to be not tolerated across the whole of the school. It wasn't seen as just a racist mm -hmm. case. It was seen that none of this is gonna happen in our school. So if we talk about good practice and bring it to the, day, to the modern day today, that means there's no bullying or harassment allowed in that school. And that was my primary school. So it really stuck with me. And I really admired our headmaster at the time. Because he you know, just the up. observation, Eileen, what yeah. you said earlier was, you prefer to go upstream and stop the thing happening. Mm -hmm. But obviously, in a sense, what happened to you has actually created a huge effect after you've left the school. Now, it's sad it had to happen, mm -hmm. but the school now has a zero approach, I guess, to what you're saying to bullying. Yeah. yeah but it well, happened once. It only happened once. Yeah. I reported once and it was sorted. So that was by P3. It never happened again. And it never happened with any other issues in that school. So yeah. it, it was done and dealt with, you know, and maybe you may think it was harsh, but it was, I would say, at least no other children were bullied or harassed in that way, you know, mm. they, well, they were not to be scared to report it. Mm. Now, you know. Le leaving aside that issue, it, it, what that says to me is, uh, my eight years on the commission, we often heard people when an act of discrimination had happened, oh, it's a bit of banter, you didn't mean it, and it was almost laughed off. And that's a way of just letting it happen. And I think, although we both agree corporal punishment wouldn't be the answer, the very fact that a school says this will not happen, this happened to be a race incident, but no bullying will be accepted here. And that, as you say, bring it forward these years. That's an important notion. Laurie, have you got an example of something you've seen or witnessed where um, either harassment or bullying has been stopped or maybe people have been working hard to sort of to make people celebrate difference? Well, I mean, I think 
if I look at it, because for me, it's, it's, it's a lot of things. And I, and I tend to look at where I've been and what has happened that gives the background to that opinion for me. And I think in Northern Ireland, there's a lot of awareness of a lot of things. I mean, even if we're talking about, for example, the origins of why you have Black History Month, you know, I think we're starting to have real conversations about the things that are wrong when you have, you know, big manufacturing companies, whether it's PG or Yorkshire Tea, actually saying, you know what, if you're a racist person, do not buy our product. And quite frankly, we're not going to miss you. You know, I think it's having not just knowing about something, it's actually doing something about it. And I think that's a really huge expectation now that every organization and every individual has a responsibility to take into account. You know, as an organization, are you being diverse enough? I mean, there's the section 75. I mean, I don't want to be too technical, but that is almost mandating people to start thinking about others differently. So whether it's a race issue or whether it's a disability or whether it's just not recognizing another person in the right context, there is a heightened awareness now where we all have to be conscious. The only downside is there are not enough consequences when we get it wrong. You know, and I think the corporal punishment that Helene was talking about, mm -hmm. yes, back in the day, corporal punishment scared the life out of any child because you did not want to get that because not only would you get it from school, you would get it at home too. So that's twice the amount of punishment. So I think we need to have something that's a lot more robust. You know, whilst we're aware, we're making efforts, there needs to be some form of, you haven't done this correctly, here's the consequence. And when that consequence is loud enough and enforced enough, then those of us who are not towing the line will have to account for that. And I think the accountability area, for me, I feel the awareness is, is greater, but we need to do more about the accountability and consequences. Well, I've got two questions for each of you to finish this part. And um, the last question is really, and you can be thinking about it, what challenge would you throw out to the people that are listening tonight to how they could actually allow a breathing space for diversity? But the, final, the penultimate question, Laurie, to you is, if I give you a magic wand and you were able to wave it and you could change one thing in terms of government policy, business approach, anything at all that you think would make a big difference to allow that breathing space for diversity? What might that be? Well, if I had a magic wand and you're giving it to, to a woman like me, a magic wand, I probably would want maybe to magically have somebody have a day in my shoes, you know, walk a mile in my shoes. I think that's probably the best way I could put it. Because sometimes when you explain to someone how difficult it is to be different, it's hard to understand. So maybe if I had a magic wand and I could swap places with you for a day, when I complain about certain things, you might not think maybe I'm being too abrasive or if I'm upset about something, I'm angry. Or if I articulate something a certain way, there's something about me that suggests I'm dissatisfied. But maybe when you've understood the journey that a lot of people have to take, you know, I'm not here just as me. I represent generations of individuals who make me mm. up. And because I have to carry that responsibility, I hear the stories and I become another addition to a generation of stories. So I want to be able to wave a magic wand that lets you feel what it's like to be me, to experience life in its fullness and its shortnesses too. And then maybe just for a second, you might have more compassion for me. You might see me not just as a diversity person, you might not just include me for the sake of including me. You might start thinking about how to be more equitable towards me and making things equitable for everybody else. Then maybe, just maybe, we might reach that equality that we all deserve. So that's what my magic wand would hopefully achieve. Wow. Eileen, <laughs> the same question for you. Here's the same magic wand. You can wave it at wherever you want. What would you do? Tough one, um, because normally it was said um, that everybody is able to be gifted with the ability to say hello and smile at somebody they don't know. Um, now we're in COVID, <laughs> we have to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. It's equally harder and it's a more difficult task. And that just comes from my past because when I had to work in Bellamina and I didn't know it very well for uh, the Ethnic Minorities Project, I had no choice but to go into the streets and find people from different ethnic minority backgrounds. And that's what I would have done, said hello and smile. And one case, 
one person turned around and just looked at me and stared and I panicked. I said, what did I do wrong? You know, I don't know your language. I knew she was Asian, but I didn't know which country. And actually she was Thai. And she turned around and she says in broken English, she says, hi, you're the first person that's spoken to me in five years. So I really learned a powerful lesson in that one. And if we could just easily do that, that would be great. So my magic wand is that everybody's tapped on the head to say hello, <laughs> hi, and smile. And that's about the conversation. Well, look, here, here's the last question to the both of you. And maybe Eileen, if you go first, and just in a sentence or two, throw out a challenge to the people listening tonight. What can they do as an individual to create a breathing space for diversity? I think listening to it all, and you know, I appreciate Laurie and stuff, you do have to do something. <laughs> So go out and do something, whether that is a smile. And I just quote because it's been in my head all day because it's preferring for this. It's one, and it's one of my favorite quotes. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Mm -hmm. So if that first step is something you do to breathe, to meet somebody, then do it. What's to stop you? And actually, given the times we're in, life is too short not to like each other. Lovely. And Laurie, the last word to you. Um, I would probably say, um, if we think about a game that we all play, which is Monopoly, you know, we, we kind of have fun and the challenges of outwitting each other to get to the end and hopefully stay out of jail. If my challenge to everyone would be think about Monopoly and how much it brings out certain elements to your personality and character when you're playing the game, especially with people you're familiar with. How about playing Monopoly? but in real life with people who are not familiar with you and see how that goes. Will you end up in jail or will you own a lot of property? So that's my one. My challenge is play Monopoly. And we need to smile when we're doing it as well, according to Eileen. Listen, it's been a delight to, to share half an hour of your lives. And we've just given people who are listening tonight a window and a big challenge as well. So I hope that those of you who listened to the first part have had a real sense that there's been this ruach, this breathing, this spirit of generosity, creating a space for diversity. We're going to have a break before the second panel come in, and we're going to have a poem from Tura Atura, Ganchir Ganchanga. Ganchir Ganchanga, Chir Gananam, Augustar Anchanga. Is the sun on him? Is there a sprague me machina de lacht full of hanage ligna? An irakt on stragish and igna occur in a henagas tie here a isle of us again. Nilangina gya, Nilangina gorum, Nilangina protestana Catholic akatame kind of gorum a hen machina dinner. Estlamse. Cheer gan changa, cheer gan nanam, August aran changa, esti san anam. Matanam shan changurun in a leg, August noram shin mushin is radaline, August ram shin mushin de hush de run man hina dini. Is lums the changa show faster? Moham and Galga, Moham Peloran, Fusna Hasna, Nakwil, Shila Aka, Nale Clenchin. Is si young Gaelic changa and um suchir a Cheer gun changa. Gan cheer, gan anam, Augustar an changa, esti san anam. Is gilgame, ta gailigam ochri, is lam sa changa so faster. Is there nach me, Agus Afrikanak faster? Gelimokri, ta gelimola. Ganchir, ganchanga, ganchir, gananam. Chir, ganchanga, ganchir, gananam. Gan
Gan cheer, gan changa, cheer, gan anum, agistar, gan changa, esti, san anum. So, you're probably wondering what I was singing about if you're not a, a Gaelic speaker. And uh, I was speaking about my desire and struggle and passion to learn the native language of this land. And my desire is not to do with uh, learning uh, or understanding Protestant or Catholic-ness uh, or black or whiteness about Irish culture or the Gaelic tradition, but more to do with the nature of people, another the nature of the people. And that nature transcends all uh, labels. And that is what I'm saying in the song, that ultimately there's a nature of our humanity which is in the language, uh, which is what I'm saying by Ganchir, Ganchanga, not a country without a language. For in the language is the spirit of the people. Language, because sound has got impact on our uh, essence, uh, Therefore, the language of this land is where the true nature and the secrets and the essence of this land that we call home, the Emerald Island, is really about. The essence of our nature is in the language. It's what I'm saying in the, in, in, in the song and the poem. And this poem, I, I wrote it with a, a good friend of mine, uh, Paul Deeds. And we wrote it about uh, 10 years ago, I think. Uh, so thank you. So welcome back, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed during during that beautiful poem. And we're now going to have another conversation. And I'm being joined today by three different colleagues. We'll be continuing some of the stuff we talked about earlier and putting some new material in as well in this broad idea of how do we create a breathing space for diversity. So I want to introduce you to the people I'll be sharing tonight with. Uh, first of all, Adriana Morvaiova. Secondly, Sheikh Anwar Madi. And finally, the Reverend Dr. Livingstone Thompson. And we're going to find a little bit about them, first of all. And then we're going to ask them about some of their experiences. And then we're going to focus a little bit on faith communities uh, in this big debate about breathing space for diversity. So first of all, we'll come to you, Adriana. Tell us a wee bit about yourself. Good evening. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Adriana Morvayova, and I live in Antrim. I'm originally from Slovakia. Um, I have Hungarian roots. My native language is Hungarian. Um, I moved to Northern Ireland 16 years ago, myself and my mother. Um, both of us, one way ticket, one suitcase each, landed into the country. Um, and just uh, for a new future and a, and a new life. I work for a local company called Sensata Technologies. I'm a team development coordinator. And I also chair a couple of um, the resource group, employee resource groups that we have. For example, I chair our um, Diversity and Inclusion Council, and I also chair our ACE group, which is Appreciating Cultural Exchange. Thank you. And we'll find a little bit about what you do a little bit later on. I'll maybe ask Anwar now, could you maybe tell us a wee bit about yourself and why this place is home for you? Uh, hi, Mike, and good evening, everybody. I'm really uh, glad to be with you tonight. Uh, my name is Anwar. I'm originally from, um, from Egypt. Um, I came uh, in 2002 to London. I was sent or seconded by the Egyptian government to work with the London Central Mosque. Uh, after I finished my term in London, I came to Northern Ireland to start working with Belfast Islamic Center as an imam or religious priest or Islamic priest or religious minister. And then I moved to another job with the same organization, uh, Belfast Islamic Center as a project coordinator. Um, this was, um, you know, I first came to Northern Ireland in 2006. So since, since that time, I'm in Northern Ireland with my children who are born, some of them are born in London and some others are born here. Um, this is why I can call my, uh, I can call Northern Ireland as my home. <laughs> So how many yeah. children, Anwar? 
so many. <laughs> <laughs> you you give them numbers rather than names. <laughs> I, I, I have I have five children. I have a big family. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking in the first part of the conversation about why you call uh, Northern Ireland as your house or your home. I would say that, yeah, yes, because I, I have five children who speak English with Irish accent, uh, you know, so why don't I say, uh, yeah, it's my home. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed. And we'll find a little bit about what you do uh, in the next round of questions. And finally, Livingstone. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you call this place home. Thank you, Michael. And it's, it's good to be here to be sharing with you guys. Yes. Um, yeah, it hasn't been a very long time that I've been in Northern Ireland. In fact, I came to Northern Ireland in 2015. I would have lived uh, some uh, nearly 15 or more years in the Republic of Ireland. I would have come to the Republic of Ireland for postgraduate work. And, um, and having finished postgraduate work, taught for some time in the university there. And then in 2015, I, I came to Northern Ireland on, um, as a, on a pastoral assignment. I'm a Moravian minister, so I came to work with Moravian churches in Belfast. So that's the reason why I'm currently in Northern Ireland, enjoying every minute of it. Well, maybe I'll just continue then with you. Uh, you talked about mm -hmm. being uh, involved in the Moravian Church here. Just mm -hmm. briefly, maybe explain for people who aren't familiar what the Moravian Church is and tell us a wee bit about uh, what you're doing here and what your work involves. Yeah, the Moravian Church is the oldest Protestant church, having been formed in 1457 and is the oldest continuing Protestant church to today. Um, it would have been established in England and Ireland in the 18th century, but it is a worldwide community um, having led in the uh, missionary endeavors in the 18th century, so it spread all over the world. So I became a member of the Moravian Church in, in Jamaica. The Moravian Church was established there in 1754, the very year actually the congregation at Kilwall in, in, out in Hillsborough was actually established. So, so there's some kind of connection there. So the work that I do is that I, I, I have pastoral responsibility for these two, two, these two congregations. I also uh, care a lot about community development work. And for that reason, I work with the African and Caribbean support organization. I am the chair of that organization. It is an organization committed to the, um, the meaningful integration and involvement of people from African and the Caribbean in Northern Ireland. And it's an organization that have been established for since 2003. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I'll maybe go to Anwar now. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what your work at the center involves. Um, as I said, when I came in 2006, I started the work as uh, the imam or the religious minister. Uh, in 2014, I was given the job of, of uh, the projects coordinator, uh, which involves um, more managerial duties. Uh, however, I continue to work on religious duties as well. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that within this time, I established uh, in Belfast Islamic Center some rules about, you know, um, you know marriage, divorces, um, you know, um, helping the Muslims in, in, let's say, in funeral, helping them at the time of bereavement. So this, there, there are some established work that has been done uh, over over the years, also I am I used to be an executive member of uh, Northern Ireland Interfaith Forum, which which mm -hmm. I was you know or I am very proud of. I was awarded the the Interfaith Forum Award I think two years ago, two years ago uh, for my uh, interfaith work and the interfaith relation. Um, also I am I am a, you know, the chaplain. Uh, uh, within the uh, Her Majesty Prison Service Services, and also with the uh, Health and Social Care Trust as a volunteer, volunteer uh, chaplain as well for the Muslim community. So it's 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 not as you may understand it, uh, as just religious work, but it's a community work. You know, helping the Muslim community at large, not within all only the Belfast Islamic Center, but with other. Muslim organizations and the non-Muslim organization, either they are religious organization or non-religious organizations as well. So I am involved in in that. Yeah. 
Well, this might put you on the spot. Um, have you any idea roughly how many people who would be following Islam that we have here in Northern Ireland? The official figure in the last census uh, was uh, 6,000 people, but we, we understand that, um, that the number is far more than 6,000 people. Mm. Because uh, in, the, in, the, in the last few years, uh, we had uh, the uh, newcomers from, from Syria and from mm. Sudan, which, mm, which are more than 2,000 people who uh, came to live uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and, also, and also the number of 6,000 people is talking only about the people with uh, e either Irish or British nationality or at least uh, indefinitely to remain. So it is, you know, it, it doesn't, doesn't count to the people who are coming here to study or study in Queen's University in particular, which is a large number of, um, of students also the people who are coming to work on a temporary basis, mm -hmm. like, you know, lecturers or doctors. So this number does not include all those people. So I expect mm -hmm. the number of Muslims here to be about, you know, 14,000. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my understanding, you know, uh, I just to tell you an idea, a rough idea. When I came in 2006, we had one, one halal shop, one halal, you know, the word halal. Mm -hmm. which is the meat which is, you know, uh, consumed by Muslims. At that time, one halal shop in, in Northern Ireland, not in Belfast, in Northern Ireland. But now we have more than 20, 22 in, North, in Belfast only. You understand me? So from 2006 mm -hmm. till, till now, there is a big change in Northern Ireland in terms of Muslim, um, with the number of Muslim people. Maybe. Thank you, thank you, Anwar. And the reason I was asking that simply is that people are sometimes unaware of the size of those people who've come from outside, many of them. And about 6% yeah. of school children now, English is their second language, and that's growing year on year. So it's just to let people be aware of the size of the interfaith community here. If I could move it over now to Adriana, uh, I'm really going to ask you the same question. Tell us a little bit about uh, your day job and the other things that you're involved in. Um, so, in my day job, I, I mostly sort of look at talent development, um, community outreach, um, how can the company sort of create new partnerships with local communities. Essensada is extremely committed to diversity, equity and inclusion. We are always looking for new partnerships and one mm. of our, probably the longest ones that we have, we're into our fourth year, is with Arts ECTA. We, we are sponsoring the Belfast Mila on a yearly basis. Um, and this came out of um, simply based on demographics that the company has. So in Northern Ireland, we have over 900 employees and in those there's 26 nationalities. So that includes British and Irish, we count that as well. So the 24 are all over the world from, we have people from Brazil, Venezuela, Pakistan, India, America, all over the world. So we're, we're very, very multicultural. Um, so that's what I would look at. Chair in the Diversity and Inclusion Council, we look at policies, company policies that we can improve. I can give you an example as, for example, our bereavement policy. We looked at it and we discovered having so many different cultures and some cultures bereave different ways. They might need more time to bereave a loss of a loved one and normally so previously we had three days factored into the policy but after looked at looking at it we add in we added in a section when obviously this is based on an individuality because every culture is different but now we we created this ability for people to come to their managers and go I need more time than three days because I may be traveling to India or I'm or maybe or maybe I have specific rituals I need to, to bereave a loss of a loved one. So we, would, so we have the, added that in. So people now are comfortable to come forward and ask for that time. And then obviously with the group we have, AS Appreciate and Cultural Exchange, we focus on, um, it's not an exchange, it's an exchange, a mutual exchange between local, the local community and the, the intercultural relationships because we realize that it's not just us trying to teach or you know teach people about other cultures the people who are moving to northern ireland they want to learn about the local culture 
they want to integrate, mm. they want to learn about the music, the food, the ways, with the ways people work and, and, and just to make it easier on them. So that's what I do. I help people. I do onboarding as well. So I would help people to, to sort of successfully relocate and integrate into the community. Mm. So for example, currently I'm working with a family who just moved over here from South Africa. And it's a young couple with two children, you know, and, and in the middle of a pandemic, you know, you're trying to trying to relocate with a big container and their belongings. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard because you can't go anywhere, you can't create relationships. So it's it's hard to try and help to help them to settle in, but we're we're doing what we can, you know. Outside my job, I I what I try to do at the minute, I do I'm doing a lot of work around accent bias. I have a natural interest in languages because I'm obviously a multilingual person and accents. And so um, just raising awareness of accent bias and accent discrimination as well. And, and just, just generally raise awareness of flexibility of mindset and, and better relationships. I have completed the Boardroom Apprentice program. And, and I obviously that's, um, I spent 12 months with the Equality Commission Northern mm -hmm. Ireland. That's how me and you met, Michael. Mm -hmm. And, and since that, I'm looking and, and applying for boards and I would love to be able to, you know, take a board position and sort of raise awareness of diversifying the boards we have here in Northern Ireland to make sure mm -hmm. that the people who live in Northern Ireland are represented on these boards. Well, let me just take that to the next series of yeah. questions and it really starting with you. Um, obviously, you're coming from the business community. Yes. And our other two colleagues are coming from faith community. So the specific question to you is, what do you think that the business community does well here to create these breathing spaces? And if you want to give an example of that, that's great. I think, so I see, I see a great commitment, you know, from, I move around the tech community. I can only sort of mm. tech and fintech. And I see a real commitment and goals being driven by the private private sector. What I would like to see more of maybe more investment into the small organizations and more relationships being created because we already invest in a lot in training. So if you spend monies on you know cultural competence training or different training sessions, we do that very well. We're very good at you know putting in quotas. We're very good at putting in targets and KPIs. But sometimes, you know, I think we are too number driven and we forget our hearts. So sometimes I think we should maybe create a little bit more or better relationships with the local communities, better outreach and, you know, bring in those to invest more money into the community. Yes, we want to invest in our own people and in, in their personal development, and um, which is cultural, cultural competence. But... Yeah, I think, I think we're doing all right. For Northern Ireland, I can definitely see, and maybe because it's coming from US, maybe because there's a large number of companies being owned, you know, or being sort of driven from the US. Maybe I think I can see a thread that there's more commitment to diversity coming from US companies than local companies. Maybe our local companies need just a little bit more time and nurture and help to bring them up to speed. Well, thanks very much. Uh, just an observation before I move on yeah. to uh, Anwar. Um, I, my passion is moving people from diversity to inclusion. Yes. And it's the idea that you've just said diversity is a bit like having the bits uh, in front of you, a recipe. But unless you put the things together and bake the cake or create the scones, you don't move from diversity to inclusion. And I think the big issue for me that I'm picking up from you is we, we've got the diversity, but the numbers, yes. the optics and the policy, but we need to move to the next stage. And that requires a push. So thanks very much for the very positive view. Anwar, maybe could I pick up from you? Um, you obviously represent and work within a faith community and indeed interfaith. Can you tell me some of the, the good things that you see happening within the faith or interfaith community in trying to create these breathing spaces? I think, yeah, in the, in the, within, within uh, our work at the Interfaith Forum, we tried our best, our, our best to, um, you know, to come uh, together for a common goal. And uh, I think one of the most um, uh, enjoyable experience for me, uh, that my visit to the uh, synagogue, I think some, some few years ago, 
when when we had um, a rabbi uh, called Rabbi Singer, who was a friend of mine, and I wanted the people to understand that you know Islam and Judaism are not clashing. You know the the the, the political the political uh, issue between you know Palestine and Israel is different from the religious issue. Uh, of Islam and Judaism. This is why we come, you know, together for this for this common goal. Um, I believe, you know, yeah, you know, I I learned a lot from the wisdom of Rabbi Singer. You know, he benefited me a lot in my in my career, and uh, we give the message to people that we are here in the Bridges Center, in the sorry, in the Jewish synagogue, to speak about you know diversity and how we understand one another. Uh, within within our culture, I mean, you know, I don't have to change you in order to accept me, or you don't have to change in order to accept you. We, we every one of us would behave as they are, uh, and the acceptance is coming from from each one of us. Um, also, let, let me just ask you a question on that because sometimes in Northern Ireland we fear the encounter with someone of another faith. It's almost as if we might be guilty. By, just because of association, you've been very clear there to say this isn't about evangelism. This is actually about learning from others without diminishing your own faith. Is that right? I yeah, I I think you're absolutely right. And I always say that we have to learn have to learn diversity within our community itself, within our you know respective community. So when I look at the Muslim community in Northern Ireland. I'm, I come from Egypt, as I told you, and the atmosphere in Egypt is different from the atmosphere of the Muslim community in Northern Ireland. Why? The Muslim community in Northern Ireland is so diverse. We, you know, they are, you know, they're representing 42 different nationalities, speaking different languages, and they come together for a common goal is to serve God, but with different understanding. So there is variety in, in the Muslim community itself. Uh, sometimes this group wanted to, you know, um, take or to pull the Islamic Center towards them or the other group wanted to pull the Islamic Center according to their Islamic understanding or, you know, understanding of Islam. However, how to keep the balance, how to keep the center for all, how to teach people to accept these minor differences or I can say these variations between us. So it is, a, it, is, it, is, it is an Islamic principle. Diversity in itself is an Islamic principle. Mm. When we read in the Quran that, you know, all people we have created you from a male and female, this is the first variety of the human being. Male and female, they are different. And we have made you into tribes and nations in order to come together and know each other. Mm. In another verse in the Quran, Allah says that if Allah wished, or if God wished, he would have made all people follow the same opinion, but he made people following different opinions because this is Allah's will or God's will to make people different. So this variety is a sort of enrichment to, to the community. So this, this is why, again, I come, when I, you know, when I remember myself coming from Egypt, I'm a different person now because mm -hmm. lots of ex different experience I gained within my community itself. So mm -hmm. I am proud of that. Well, thank you for that, because obviously what you're challenging us is that you actually only grow by taking a risk, by being vulnerable, but by listening to other people. Yeah. And maybe Livingstone, I can, I can come to you and ask you the same type of question. Um, have you examples of where faith communities have actually worked hard to create these breathing spaces? And maybe could you give an example? Yeah, in a way, before speaking about the breathing space being created, I think it is important to admit that the churches themselves, because of their very nature, have had an inclination to organize themselves as units separate and apart. And that there has been a real uh, work of over a century challenging the, ch challenging the churches to move towards a kind of a ecumenical venture. But it is not very easy for some churches to be able to do that. Part of the reason why that doesn't happen is because there is a presumption of um, orthodoxy, which uh, s some churches say what we do is right and what others do is wrong. And that, in a way, has been a very uh, has been the Achilles heel of some of the collaborative ventures that may 
uh, may in fact come from the churches. So you will find that individual churches may undertake their projects, but they do it in very individualistic way. And that in and of itself, um, whereas it is good as an outreach venture, it is not necessarily very effective as a collaborative venture. There are a number of examples, nevertheless, of, of where um, churches have come together to, to ensure that they can be a much more effective way of responding to the challenges of diversity. I should say, first of all, that the, the Irish Council of Churches, which is a venture that goes back to the 1920s, is something which has been a, a, a bulwark of, uh, of, 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 of unity in the face of a society that has been inclined to be uh, to have fissions and separations. And so the, the historic divisions within the religious communities in Northern Ireland, which in a sense sometimes overlap with the, um, the, the, the social communities and even the geographical communities where people live, have had a negative impact on some of what those ventures be. But the, the Irish Council of Churches is one example where the churches have come together and in coming together, they have addressed issues relating to peace, they have addressed issues relating to faith communities, that is to say, those who are beyond the, the, the Christian community, uh, figuring a way in which to engage with the Islamic and Jewish communities. It is in that context, the churches have also, um, the Irish also churches, for example, have taken a lead in dealing with issues relating to the attitude to migration and supporting the migration process assisting with the housing of individuals who then become, become, become destitute, but also with the relocation of individuals within the broader Irish community. In this regard also, we have um, projects where individual congregations or con groups or congregations together support ventures um, in which there would be the um, English classes for those individuals who may need to be, have support with, with, um, with, with English. And then you have projects relating to um, capacity building for participation in, in um, economic life. So development in terms of education. So these ventures happening, for example, along the Lisbon Road um, and in the Greater Belfast area, um, these are examples where the churches have made a difference in responding to the challenges of a diverse community. But it should, I should want you to also add, however, that um, in, a, in, a, in a significant way, the churches are the ones who have played a significant role in challenging government policy in relation to migration, in relation to uh, the, the, uh, the services that are provided for people and the kind of a disadvantage that um, migrant communities may be, uh, may, may be experiencing. They've also challenged policies relating to education uh, that they must be, uh, they must be, they, they must move towards a much more inclusive education because education is one of those areas in which there is a kind of a reinforcement of the uh, historic divides which have been detrimental and anti-inclusive. Um, well, let me ask you just that we're moving across towards the end now because I, I want to ask two final questions. The last one's going to be the same one to throw the challenge out to people. But you have this magic wand that I gave to those in the first part. Who, who would you wave it at? And just briefly, what would you hope that that wish would actually deliver? And I'm thinking of, of the faith communities. What, what, would you, what would your wish be for those faith communities? Yeah, I think faith communities um, with a magic wand, being able to um, share their resources much more much smartly would, would make a lot of difference. Many of the way in which resources in terms of human resources and financial resources are being spent. It's being spent in a way that is, is, is divided. And if the resources were able to be brought together, the impact would be a lot different. If the churches were able to, um, to, to together um, spend their resources in relation to health and education, they could make a lot of difference in terms of those sectors in the economy. So. Um, bringing together resources, human and financial, is where I would think the smart money would be with a magic wand. Thanks very much indeed. And the same question then to Anwar. Uh, I'm giving you the magic wand. Uh, you don't have to just think about Islam. You might want to think of all faith communities, but what would your wish be? 
I think you know my 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 wish is to is to speak about it to our respective communities within our you know um, churches, mosques, synagogues. You know, they are just I I wish that the faith leaders take the responsibility and speak about you know um, having a diverse society, accepting everyone. Um, this is this is this this is my wish, in Northern Ireland, because. I just wanted to be, you know, um, a frank here. Northern Ireland for me represents a puzzle in a way. You know, this country, I witnessed the overwhelming support to the newcomers from Syria and Sudan. I witnessed this myself, overwhelming support from the local community. And also I witnessed the, uh, the, Aris, uh, the, the burning or the burning of the uh, Belfast Multicultural um, Association very recently, if you are aware of. So it is, it is, you know, um, you know, sometimes some, you know, I, I, I believe that it's, it's a, the, the people in Northern Ireland are, are friendly by nature, are naturally friendly. They are so friendly, you know, whether uh, either they are your neighbors, the people you meet in the street. So whenever I come across hate crime, um, or a hate incident, I, I wonder, is it the same uh, society that, you know, they are welcoming you in the street? You know, just I remember, you know, when my, my, my mother-in-law uh, was, was, was walking with me in the streets of Belfast and everybody was saying, good morning, how are you? And her common question was, uh, do you know them? No, I don't know them, but this is the, <laughs> this is the norm here that people, you know, you know, greet each other here. This, this is Northern Ireland. At the same time, you, uh, you know, as you, as you said in the introduction that the uh, race incidents uh, overweigh the uh, sectarian incidents, which is, you know, again, a kind of a puzzle, you know. Mm. So I believe that we have the responsibility to shoulder, that we have to speak to our you know, community, we have to speak to our mass about, you know, um, accepting the others and uh, being a diverse society. Thank you very much indeed. And it was terrible to see the scenes of the fire. And I know I, I've just taken over as chair of Karamila and, and I remember that we were praying at our last Karamila meeting and we were just thinking about it. And I know there's been an overwhelming support in terms of finance and the just giving pay. Yeah, yeah. But it can't just be about money. It has to move beyond that. So please do bring back all of our best wishes and prayers. If I can move to you, uh, Adriana, um, just the same question. You've got the magic wand and you're going to wave it at the business community or the broad community. What would that wish be? Um, if I was to use it on like the, the broader community, I would maybe wish that everybody would lose their negativity bias because we tend to, we are hardwired to negative experiences and, and we tend to remember those longer. So um, for every bad experience, we need 10 good experiences mm. to, to erase that one and to be able to, to build a society that co cohabits in peace and, and create this amazing exchange between different cultures, we need to be able to have a lesser of a negativity bias and don't sort of tarnish or use a broad brush when we do have an experience with someone from a certain, maybe you maybe experience a Slovakian person who was rude to you. Don't carry that with you for the other 10 Slovakians you will meet after. Give them a clean slate. And for the business community, I would love business community to sort of have this new find um, appetite for, you know, and, and wanting to create new connections and partnerships with local charities and little communities, minority communities, and bringing them into, you know, their, their businesses to learn from them and, and, and use the resources uh, I have previously, you know, had a chance not just to work with Art Sector, but Exoni as well, the African Caribbean Association. And these people leverage and have these resources of amazing cultural knowledge and competence. And you can take that knowledge and bring it into your employees, train your employees, and then you can use it when you're dealing with customers, you're dealing internally with different multicultural cultural teams. 
So the possibilities are endless. We just need mm. to be more open minded to use them. Well, well, just when you're on that passion, um, the final question, really, and two sentences, throw the challenge out. What can people who are watching this and listening to this do to create these breathing spaces? Right. So challenge one, private companies invest more money into the local community. Throw yourselves at them. Small ones. The big ones, some of the big ones get quite a bit of money, but the smaller ones, seek out the ones that you don't hear, don't see. Challenge two for everybody individually is, whew, I don't know, contact, meet people, go out and meet people. So I think contact works to diminish, to sort of build more understanding. And, and the more you sort of expose yourself to new cultures, new foods, Try something, like try a new dish this week. Try something you have never had before. Even if you're not sure you're going to like it or not, try it. There's the challenge. Uh, eat out and get to know people. <laughs> well, let's, well, maybe just <laughs> With a mask yet. and social yeah. distance. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, no Adriana. Uh, Anwar, the same question to you in a couple of sentences. What's the challenge you want to throw out to the faith communities? Uh, the challenge that I wanted to throw out, not for the faith communities, but it's for the, in maybe the government organizations or government institution that I want the service providers to be, you know, given or to be done by everybody, you know, uh, from the local community and from the ethnic minorities as well. You know, just, it's, um, it's sad for me when I go for, uh, to the Belfast City Council, and I couldn't see any other, you know, or any different color. I like to see different colors, you know, giving the service to people. So this is very, very important. Of course, it's completely different in England. You know, when you go to hospitals or to any other places, the, the, the service mm. providers are completely or are so diverse. I would like that to be Northern Ireland as well. And this, for me, represents that walk the walk rather than talk the talk. And it's about, you know, that lovely truism, you can't be what you can't see. Uh, and, and we're challenging that, the move from diversity to inclusion. And the last word goes to you, Livingstone. And what challenge do you want to throw out to people who are listening to this? Yes, Michael, for people, whether they are in the faith communities or whether they are involved in businesses or whether they are involved in educational institutions, one of the things that I'd suggest is that uh, each community, each business, each school, each church that they sign up to what we call a racism free business, that they will say to their business, we are not tolerating racism in our business. We will say to our, ch the churches will say, we will not tolerate aid and abet racism that the educational institutions will say this and they will make it a part a central to their policy. If every business, every community were to do that and make it a matter of their policy, which they then work out in strategy and practices, I think we will have a, a, a turning around of the situation where the race incidents are now overtaking the sectarian incidents, which is a great concern. Well, I, I just want to draw this in. I think this has been a really good space where Ruach has, has had space. The breath has been there. We've been uh, allowing some conversations on diversity. And I want to thank Eileen and Laurie in the first part. And I want to thank Adriana and Anwar and Livingstone for the contributions they made. And I just want you out there who are watching this to be on easy taste. Elliot, in the journey of the Magi, said the reason the wise men moved was they were no longer at ease with this dispensation. It is, it, we should not be easy with where we are. There has to be something better. And I think what we've had in this last hour and a half is that space opened up to the what ifs and the challenges that you've got. At least we can smile at one another. At least we can get to know each other and sample their food. But there's a huge challenge in this. We're going to bring it to a close now by Tura Tura coming to us again, this time in song. And we're going to listen to the song Penway. Thanks very much for journeying with us and go out and create those spaces.
Life is not about who's right, who's wrong, who's weak, who's strong. Pin away, pin away. It's not about who's black, who's white. Is it day or night? Pin away. for watching. We really hope you've enjoyed this event and have taken away a challenge and we'll come back to other events in our annual festival. We're deeply grateful to our funders, particularly the Executive Office, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Belfast City Council through its Good Relations Programme. We'd also like to thank our loyal friends at the festival who donate regularly throughout the year as well as everyone who has donated to us in the lead up to and during this year's festival. Your support is invaluable in enabling the festival to grow and become more sustainable. The coronavirus pandemic means that I can't hold up this Tesseract collection box this year, 
as I do annually. But I encourage you to support the cost of running and developing the festival by visiting fourcornersfestival.com slash donate and making a one-off gift or signing up as a friend of the festival. Finally, feedback and funders go hand in hand. So although we can't hand you a paper feedback form on the way out the door, we'd appreciate if you could fill in our online form at fourcornersfestival.com slash feedback. We sat back, breathed, and decided that the 2021 festival would carry on virtually. We hope you'll be able to join us in person next year as we continue to connect people from across the city of Belfast and beyond, encouraging us out of our own corners in order to encounter new perspectives, new ideas, and the possibility of making new friends. Thank you.